Thanks for coming out and uh, participating in our talk today. My name's Tom Jones. Uh, actually, my nickname's Elvis. Uh, Tom Jones and Elvis both seems appropriate for being on stage in Las Vegas. So um, I hope everybody's having a good time today. We're going to dive into some uh, deep learning here. And uh, I'm going to have uh, Diego come out and talk about his company, Algorithmia, and the things that they're doing to make deep learning accessible to everyone. But first, I want to pro provide a little bit of context. So um, we've seen this <laughs> in some of the announcements today, but highlighting the pace of innovation at AWS, right? we can see the, the trend line here. Obviously, this is going to need to be updated after all the announcements we've had this week. Um, but uh, AWS has a furious pace of innovation. And so if we, we start looking at trends, we see this pace of innovation trend. And then um, we've seen other types of trends as well. So we're seeing a rapid adoption of things like microservices using serverless architectures with services like AWS Lambda, API Gateway, using containers, right? All of these provide pay-as-you-go scalability. Another trend that we're seeing is uh, a huge amount of interest and uptake in machine learning to drive things like predictive analysis and things like generative design. And the equation's really, really simple. You can build a smart application by leveraging your existing data and machine learning. And we're going to see how Algorithmia can help with that. Tying in with uh, these trends and this, this pace of innovation, AWS recently launched the P2 instance family. It offers up to 16 NVIDIA K80 GPUs in a single instance. That's eight K80 cards, physical cards in a single instance, giving you up to 70 teraflops of single point uh, floating point precision performance, or uh, more than 23 teraflops of double precision floating point performance. And it was designed for workloads like deep learning, computational fluid dynamics, um, seismic analysis, molecular modeling, genomics, and more. And this is what the family looks like. We've got three different instances here, starting with a single GPU in the P2 extra large. Uh, moving up to our, our middle instance here, the, the P2-8XL, with eight GPUs and 10 gigabytes of bandwidth in a placement group. Uh, and then our biggest instance, our biggest instance, if I could talk, is the P2-16XL, right? With those 16 GPUs, uh, 732 gigabytes of memory, and 20 gigabytes of bandwidth. So massive, massive performance. So in summary, we've got a pace of innovation here. We've got new hardware, right? And this is a fantastic vehicle to accelerate machine learning workloads. And with that, uh, I'd like to invite Diego to the podium. And we're going to find out what they've been up to at Algorithmia and the exciting things that they're doing using AWS services and the P2 instance family. Diego? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's see here. There you go. So I'm Diego Oppenheimer. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Algorithmia up in Seattle. Uh, my background has always been in uh, data and advanced analytics. Uh, I've been a product developer. I've worked on things like Power Pivot, Power BI Excel, um, did a trading startup before that. Um, Algorithmia, I'm going to introduce us ourselves a little bit, what we do, and then kind of move into how we've actually deployed deep learning. So what our mission is as a company is to make state-of-the-art algorithms accessible and discoverable by, by everyone. And this is a simple mission in the sense that we think that no matter what technology, what programming language, or where you are, you should have access to the state-of-the-art algorithms that exist out there. And this is everything from machine learning models to image processing algorithms to deep learning models. So what does the marketplace for algorithms mean? 
So we turn algorithms into scalable microservices by taking advantage of the latest technologies in containerization, uh, as well as API management and deep monitoring. Uh, researchers from universities, independent developers, uh, national labs, they grab their work that, uh, that they would usually either just host statically on GitHub, they push it into our system, we turn it automatically into an API, uh, a containerized microservice, deploy it, now it's available for any developer on Earth to call through a simple REST API. Really, really easy to do. So once we already have it there, now uh, any developer calling that in their applications, it's metered by the second in terms of compute. And so you're only using the resources that you need. Talking about that kind of like term and serverless as well as you know, just-in-time computing. So we also provide an automatic taxonomy on how to uh, grab all these algorithmic microservices and organize them, search them. We make it really easy to find what you're doing by the different use cases, et cetera. And of course, if the algorithm developer or the person creating these services wants to, we give an ability to monetize it. So they can charge on a pair API call, uh, and we act like an app store in terms of a 70-30 split with them. 70 to them, by the way. Um, so what do I mean by uh, you know, algorithms? So we have over 2,600 of these available today that any developer can call. And it starts with things in the natural language processing world, like uh, you know, summarizers and sentence standards and profanity detection. Uh, we move into audio and video splitting, speech recognition, file conversions, uh, and then go into kind of deep learning tasks. Like we're going to show you a couple of demos, everything from style transfer to image classification to audio classification. Uh, and all of these, all 2,600, are always live and available for anybody to call. And when we talk about it, you know, these as microservices, we mean it. Like any of these can actually be deployed at any moment um, as soon as you decide to invoke it as a developer. So we think of ourselves as kind of like building out the machine intelligence stack with the components that exist today. So most of you have data stores that you already work with, a lot of them already in Amazon. Uh, and then on top of that, they're actually providing with this amazing scalable CPU and GPU compute. Algorithmia lies on top of that, taking advantage of those data stores as well as that scalable CPU and GPU compute to provide these algorithmic microservices. So then you can come in and actually do the interesting part, which is build smart applications in whatever language you want and whatever language your stack is in. So what do we mean by scale and why do we need this scalable GPU compute? So our system is a multi-tenancy system. We have over 32,000 individual developers calling algorithms uh, at any given time. We provide, you know, we get to go through AWS, we get access to this massive amount of hardware that allows us to scale and provide that experience to all the, as well as CPUs as well as GPUs. And this also means that our traffic is extremely spiky. At some times we get massive amount of need for compute, at other times it's not so much. Uh, and so we need to, for our own economics, need to be able to do that scaling up and down uh, in real time. So to give a general idea around the scale of containers, so um, as of a couple of weeks ago when I measured, we generate and destroy about 150,000 containers a day. Uh, and this is all done automatically by our system. So what does it mean by hosting deep learning? So this is actually presents, this is something that we got into about uh, six months ago, we launched our support for a lot of deep learning frameworks. And there's a lot of complexity around hardware and software dependencies, which is what I'm gonna be talking about mostly today. Um, we had to learn how to say to our developers, say, well, you're already developing in some framework, so we grab the most popular deep learning frameworks and make them work in our system. We had to deal with spicy key traffic on GPUs. It wasn't just like, we couldn't just rent a whole bunch of GPUs and let them sit there. If they're not gonna be unused, that would be cost prohibitive. We had to deal with multi-tenancy on GPUs, and this is something that not a lot of people think about, but we've been developing CPUs in a multi-tenancy world for about 30 years. Like, these things are figured out at this point, like uh, how to do multi-tenancy on, on CPUs. GPUs, that is not the case. Sharing GPUs and multi-tenancy is actually extremely hard to do, uh, especially when you're trying to use containerization and load them side by side. And then how do we, you know, how we had to approach building an extensible dynamic architecture uh, to support deep learning. So really quickly, I'm gonna do a very, very brief introduction to like deep learning and some of the frameworks. But just by a show of hands here, how many people have interacted with a deep learning framework? Okay. Uh, how many people have gone beyond the tutorial 101 on a deep learning framework? A little bit less. How many people here have actually put in a deep learning system into live production? Four or five, okay. 
decent amount, but very, very few people in the room. So, and this is it, like this is the, the truth here is that a lot of people are wanting to work with deep learning. A lot of people are very, very interested in it, but the actual amount of people, and that means the amount of documentation and research and uh, that about putting these, uh, things into production is actually not quite there yet. So at the super basic level, deep learning is actually uses artificial neurons to mimic how the brain uh, represents data, high dimensional data. So it actually excels in tasks where there's like a very basic unit, uh, unit of um, basic unit, like a single pixel or frequency or word that has very little meaning as itself. But as you go through the different layers, it can become telling a new story. So. Where we've seen deep learning being used a lot is actually in unstructured data. And recently, we've had this explosion on unstructured data. Just your phones are probably the largest producers of unstructured data that we can see out there uh, in terms of videos, pictures, audio, speech. And then you get to websites and log files and social media. And we have to be able to interpret this data. And this is where deep learning as a technique, because of how good it is with unstructured data, uh, can actually be applied to. So the production use cases we see today, so you might have seen the announcement yesterday around Amazon uh, recognition. Uh, you know, Google has their own. There's a company called Clarify that has theirs. Um, you know, Microsoft has their own. So image classification, object detection, face recognition are definitely being used already by a lot of different uh, software developers. Natural language, you know, so peach to text, chatbots, Q and A systems, machine translation. These are the other production systems that we've actually seen. Optimization, anomaly detection, and finally recommender systems uh, that are being used. Uh, on unstructured data. So this is where we're really seeing live production systems today uh, in the world of deep learning. So why now? Anybody who's been reading any news has probably just seen deep learning. Actually, this is a challenge for when you go to TechCrunch and open the page and then just do Control F and type in deep learning. And I bet money, I'll buy your beer if you don't see at least one result. And there's a reason why this has become really, really popular recently is that there's kind of been like three moving forces that have gotten to the world where like why this has become important. One is that, so the research actually comes from the 80s. Um, in which you know the first kind of neural nets were deployed, but they required an immense amount of data that was hard to get to. They required an immense amount of compute that was extremely expensive, and uh, the, you know the hardware wasn't just quite there yet. In the, there's been advances in research from Jan LeCun, who works now at Facebook, uh, Hinton and Bengio over the last couple of years that have made these networks faster and more efficient. There's been advances in hardware. The use of GPUs for actually doing the calculations allows us for these, uh, you know, the deep learning, why it's deep is we can go deeper into the le levels of the neural net so that we can, uh, which produce higher results. And that requires an, a massive amount of computation. And GPUs are really, really good at this. Um, and then the final one is that the amount of data is finally there. We've been spending millions of dollars on storing every single log file, every single image, everything we could for the last 10 years. Now we actually have data sets. So we can start applying these deep learning techniques between the availability of a massive amount of compute, like things like AWS and Azure that give you that expansibility, the hardware that is there, the use of GPUs, and the fact that we have data. Now deep learning is starting to show really shine in this world of unstructured data. And you can see on the, uh, on, on, the, on the graph here, which is the accuracy. ImageNet is kind of the, the gold standard for our measuring accuracy in image recognition. And this is what's been used for a while. And you can see as soon as 2011, when uh, you know, deep learning was started to use on top of GPUs, the accuracy just completely left uh, everything else back, all the other methodologies for doing normal computer vision. Uh, and this is why it's exciting and everybody wants to talk about it right now. So hardware. So GPUs today, NVIDIA is dominating. Um, they made a big bet, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about like what bet they made there and why it's important, but they've actually really been dominating the deep learning space. Um, the first GPU for neural nets uh, was on an NVIDIA GTX 280. Uh, the NVIDIA chips and tend to outperform on the types of operations that are required for deep learning over AMD. And the most important part, the key here, is that every single framework supports CUDA, which is the primitives inside uh, that, that, that NVIDIA has made available for using with their chips. And that is actually the thing that's been driving the most uh, people over to NVIDIA. So today, uh, we're starting to see the GPU is like the main 
deep learning like chipset, but we're starting to see specialization. Very similar to how we saw in the world of Bitcoin, where people started mining on CPUs, then moved to GPUs because it was faster, and then we got specialized hardware in the sense of ASICs. We're starting to see the exact same trend in the deep learning world, where we're starting to see FPGAs, recently announced as of yesterday, the F1s, Microsoft has their own version, and then we're seeing ASICs, Google's TPUs, IBM's True North, the Nirvana engine, and graphic cores, IPUs. And these are chips where you're essentially getting rid of everything that's not necessary, so you can just do the calculations required for doing deep learning. Going into deep learning dependencies, this is what the deep learning stack looks like. So you start at the driver uh, at the chipset level, which is the GPU. Then you have the NVIDIA driver on top of that. The CUDA, which is the first set of primitives. Uh, the CUDA-N, which is actually providing you the primitives for like the actual neural nets. And then you actually have the deep learning frameworks, which I'm going to talk a little bit about more. And then recently, we've started seeing these meta deep learning more, more, uh, uh, frameworks, which I call like deep learning making accessible for mortals like myself. Um, you know, in, in, in what's called like Keras, which actually will give you like really, really nice Python interfaces to be able to interact with them. So deep learning frameworks, there's a ton. I can't review them all. I'm going to do a really, really quick pass through them so we can get to the interesting part, which is the architecture. So the five ones that we support today are on our platform, are Cafe, TensorFlow, Theano, MXNet, and Torch. We're actually adding uh, a couple more, like CNTK, uh, and, and, and as some other networks become more popular, we actually uh, add them to our platform as well. Um, but I'll do a quick review of them. So Theano uh, was created by University of Montreal. Uh, it's really kind of pioneered the symbolic graph for programming a network. Very, very mature net, uh, network been, a framework. It's been used for a long time. It has good supports for many types of different networks. Um, pros for it, uses Python and NumPy. It has a declarative computational graph. Uh, it has good support for recursive neural nets. And uh, it has these wrapper frameworks like Keras, Lasagna, and Blocks, which allow you to kind of do like, uh, app, that makes it more accessible and easier to use the APIs with better error messaging, et cetera. BSB license. The cons is that it's like a low-level framework. The error message, it's like almost impossible to debug. Uh, error, the error messages are really, really unhelpful. Uh, and this is something that you'll see in a couple of the different frameworks. Um, large models uh, can have really, really long compile times. And there's weak support for pre-trained models, which means that you can't just go find an already existing, it's hard to find existing pre-trained models that you can have as a starting point. So Torch. Uh, so this is actually a collaborative research. Uh, this is actually what DeepMind used before they got acquired by Google. So they're now moved over to TensorFlow. Uh, and it was actually, they were the, kind of the pioneering and actually using Torch as well. Uh, it's a general uh, scientific computing framework that loses Lua. Um, and that kind of produces some of the problems. You have to know Lua. Uh, so Torch is more flexible than TensorFlow and Theano. It's that it's imperative, uh, while the uh, TensorFlow and Theano are actually declarative. Uh, it makes some operations much easier to do. Uh, the, pro, the pros, as I said, are very flexible, multi-dimensional array engine, multiple backends uh, like CUDA and OpenMP and as well OpenCL. Uh, there's lots of pre-trained models available, and I'm going to actually show a couple of the ones that we've used. Uh, the cons is that it's Lua. Uh, and there's not that many Lua developers out there. Uh, it's not good for recurrent nets, and there's actually a complete lack of commercial support because it's been uh, mostly an academic project for a really long time. CAFE, so this was created at the Berkeley Vision and Learning Center. Uh, they're kind of the pioneers of computer vision, uh, and that's no surprise that CAFE is kind of the gold standard for doing image recognition tasks. Uh, probably the most common used framework today it's optimized for feedforward networks, convolutional nets, and image processing. Uh, it has a simple Python API, um, good license. The cons are that when you actually are adding new GPU layers, you have to do C++ plus CUDA programming, which can be difficult at times. Uh, limited support for recurrent neural nets. Uh, and then when, it become, when you're using really, really large networks, it becomes like a really cumbersome framework to work with. TensorFlow. So this was created by Google. Uh, it's written with a Python API over a C++, C and C++ engine, re uh, generates a computational graph, and performs automatic differentiation. Uh, the pro is that it uses Python and NumPy again. This is really common. Like, for a good network, you want to use Py uh, you know, Python and NumPy. Lots of interest from the community. So Google's done an amazing marketing effort in getting TensorFlow out there uh, and having a lot of people talk about it as uh, you know, something to go there. So that's, you know, that 
gives, if you're going to go into uh, deep learning, it's like a pretty safe bet that there's a lot of community being built around this, although there's not that much support for it just yet. It's highly parallel and designed to use various backends. It can be on software-only mode, it can be on CPU mode, it can be on GPU mode, and it can also be on ASIC mode, which is not surprising given the announcements that Google did recently. It has an Apache license. It's a lot slower than the other networks um, and frameworks. Uh, it has more features but uh, and, you know, and more abstractions than Torch, and there's not many pre-trained models. And this is a kind of common uh, thread here that like the availability of pre-trained models is how most deep learning practitioners are going to get up and started with these things, so that becomes really important. So finally, when you're going to do training, um, you know, the you don't start from scratch designing a neural net unless you are in a research institution or in an academic. Like you usually what you'll do is you'll grab a pre-trained neural net uh, of some sort that has a similar task to what you're trying to achieve uh, and start there as kind of like a, as your starting point. And so you can get a lot of these like VGG, Google Net, AlexNet, SqueezeNet. Um, Cafe Model Zoo is a fantastic place to go get pre-trained models. Uh, and that's where you can kind of say, well, if I see that, you know, I see a model in, in Cafe Model Zoo that's really good on training on recognizing, you know, animals of some sort, maybe I can grab that uh, same network and start replicating with a new data set into recognizing insects. So, like, if you're going to be doing, like, similar classification stacks and images and stuff like that, like, you can pretty much start from, uh, you know, some of these pre-existing ones. So big difference here, and, and this will become a lot clearer as I go into the architecture, which is there's two very distinct phases in the deep learning world. One which is called training, and the other one which is actually running it or called inference. And they are completely different tasks with very, very different approaches on how you actually scale and do them. I'm mostly going to concentrate on running and inference. So what this means is once I've already trained the model, either I've done it in parallel or not, um, you know. Once that is set, like, how am I going to actually make it available to applications to call into that model and make it internet scale? There's a ton of research as well as um, frameworks and companies concentrating on the training part. Um, so we're going to talk about running these models at scale. So hosting deep learning models uh, available as an API represents a unique set of challenges. Uh, that are rarely, if ever, really addressed in tutorials. Uh, and as I said, like most people have gotten to the end of tutorial 101 on, on TensorFlow, so one they were like, okay, well, how do I hook up my mobile application to this? Because it's not going to run off your laptop. And, or how am I going to hook up my web application? So why would you want machine learning in the cloud? So for us, it's kind of obvious. Uh, you you want to react to live user data. You don't want to manage your own servers. Uh, you don't want to have to have enough servers to sustain your max load at any given time, because you can. So you can use, save money by using these cloud services. And then on mobile, in particular, like although there's a really interesting research coming out of Facebook around Cafe on mobile, um, there's a very limited computing power on top of your phone. Uh, not to mention what it's going to do to your battery uh, to be able to run these neural nets on it. So you want to use the internet as kind of like a way and, and, and services to be able to scale those. So I'm going to talk about a simple use case here. So we actually launched this um, a couple of months ago. Uh, I'm going to show a quick demo of it as soon as this comes alive. And the idea here was that, uh, there we go. Yeah. See there? Go. So Colorizer was a research that came from Berkeley. It's an actually a cafe model. And it's a neural net that was trained at the lab there to colorize black and white pictures using a neural net and to actually being able to turn them into color pictures. And so what this is actually happening behind the scenes here is we grab the original image, which is a black and white image, and the neural net is essentially guessing based on the pre-trained data set what the colors might look like on this image. And as you can see, this is a completely artificially painted picture, but it's getting it pretty accurate. Uh, and this is kind of where like, you know, that, that, that magic starts coming to be. So now there's a neural net that can actually process black and white pictures and turn them into color. And so why is this interesting is that we actually you know, grab, you know, the model was put on Algorithmia by the researchers. We created this website, and we put it out there for people to use it. And so now every API is actually hitting, and we're using the internet, and we're colorizing it. And what happened 48 hours after we created this demo is that it landed on the front page of Reddit. And so as you know, the front page of Reddit has a bit of traffic. 
Uh, and that was a real test of how does, you know, how do you actually scale a real live system that is using inference or, you know, you're actually running those, this model at scale so that millions of users can actually hit it all at once and you're going to actually provide that performance. So, let's see here, back to there. So this is what actually our peak graph looked like um, when we were actually uh, doing that over the next couple of hours and days that when we got to the front page of Reddit. So at one given time, I think you know, within the first 48 hours, uh, over one point one and a half million images had been colorized. Uh, there was a Reddit that had you know 4,000 different posts on it about uh, you know these images, and the most important part from our perspective was we were down for 0, 0.0 minutes uh, during this process. And the reason we could do that is because of the elastic compute that we had under our, our platform that allowed us to scale as the traffic was coming in and then scale down as the traffic started tapering off. So if you look at the, uh, the chart here, if we had actually done capacity planning, we would have overpaid by about 75% of what we needed uh, in terms of the actual uh, performance there. And so now, we, with, with using the elastic compute, we were actually allowed to scale down or scale up at peak, and then scale down our system so that only those pieces, uh, you know, we paid for what we, we cared about using. So the important part here is that a service-oriented architecture is exactly what you want to do if you're going to start deploying deep learning in the cloud. And a big reason of it is because that deep learning is extremely computationally intense. And so if you started, for example, having your API servers or uh, your front-end servers also trying to process the neural net on the GPU or even on the CPU, what you're going to realize is it's going to completely choke out the resources of the rest of your system. So deploying the actual computation piece as its own kind of like worker fleet uh, is a way so that the rest of the system can stay up and snappy. And then all you need to do is keep on adding pieces to that worker fleet. So in our world, you know, we grab one of these uh, you know, algorithms or models, we containerize them, and then we pack them into these GPU workers. Uh, and as efficiently as we can, and, to, and then ma manage the memory in between them so that they don't kind of like run into each other. And so that allows us to actually just scale the worker fleet as we get these like huge peaks of traffic. So how it looks on AWS, um, we have, you know, obviously the clients and all the different languages that you would go call. Um, you have the load balancers, uh, which are, you know, which we are, we are using ELB, our API servers, which are mostly using M4s. Uh, and then we have two fleets, a CPU worker fleet, uh, where we do a combination of M4s and X1s. Uh, and then our GPU fleet, which is purely on P2s today, uh, which have given us kind of that advantage of being able to, uh, to scale these out. Why P2s? Well, the first one, they have a lot more memory. So, and you care a lot about that because when you're loading a neural net, it's all getting loaded in memory and, uh, you know, the more memory, the better. It's a fact. Like, you want more memory. And it's the memory per GPU that matters because memory sharing between GPUs is early. Oh, let's, let's leave it there. Uh, so modern CUDA supports the other one. So there's more CUDA cores to run in parallel. There's new messages, which means useful things for debugging. Uh, and in particular, we actually had a problem with the old CUDA uh, 3.0. That's what was in the G2s, where you couldn't do memory management and you couldn't share memory, which meant that if we had a multi-tenancy environment, we could only have one session loaded per GPU at any given time. The whole thing falls apart there because you know if we had a peak like that, then I don't know what the capacity was in those regions, but I'm assuming we would be getting a call from AWS saying like you don't get any more. Um, and then the price per flop actually works out really well. So customer showcase from our perspective. So CS Disco is a company um, uh, down in Texas. Uh, they offer this fantastic technology of doing e-discovery, uh, you know, for legal firms uh, using like advanced NLP. Uh, and, you know, what they wanted to do is be able, like, uh, you know, customer comes in, they say they're about to go into a lawsuit, they have to go into a discovery, they've just been dumped with 10, 15 million documents, they need to process those as quickly as possible and give an interface to the lawyers so that they can actually go and find what's relevant, and then they're using NLP techniques, uh, including word to vec and a couple of neural nets, to try to kind of, like, find other things that look like this in those massive amount of documents, something that used to be done with, like, 300 uh, paralegals. 
So they, you know, this, this is what they do. They use a combination of different neural nets. So they came to us because, one, they wanted the scalability of being able to have that peak traffic. Once those lawsuits come in or once those customers come online, it's a massive amount of compute all at once that they want to quickly get under, their, uh, you know, under for them and then be able to like, deprecate like, really quickly. They want the flexibility to have peaks at certain hours, uh, which is usually when lawyers are working. Um, and then they want to be able to reduce ghost compute, as I showed. Like, you know, they could actually do the capacity planning, but they would end up playing for a lot of cycles on the GPUs that they didn't want to have to take care of. So the final one, which is what we do on our platform, which allows the chaining of all these microservices and algorithms or piping them into each other. And so when they had four or five different neural nets that they're different using, as well as other NLP algorithms, it made sense to have everything as independent microservices that could be chained together for the different tasks. And so that's kind of how they, uh, you know, they came to us to help um, you know, do that scaling and put it on. So now I'm going to talk about kind of the challenges of um, you know, working with EC2 uh, and sometimes where it helps. So this is the things that we actually hit when working with uh, you know, different deep learning frameworks uh, that was, uh, you know, and, and kind of, this is my, this is what we did so you don't have to, hopefully. <laughs> so challenge number one, so new hardware. So when we started looking into uh, deep learning, um, there wasn't much option. So you have a couple of smart providers like Nimbix, Seriscale, Penguin that were providing different uh, you know, GPUs available to you. You could go build your own GPU racks, if, you know, which is, again, pretty expensive. SoftLayer had some Tesla K80 cards and M60s. Um, as of now, Google just announced preview of their cards. Uh, Azure just announced their N-series. Uh, and then AWS is probably one of the first ones that had really an elasticity around GPU compute. Uh, but they had old hardware in the beginning, um, and now they have the P2 instances. And this is really important because CUDA will be what you like live and die about when you're actually doing the scaling here. Uh, if you don't have the latest version of CUDA, like you start running into a whole lot of uh, uh, problems, and I'll kind of talk about uh, why that is. So language bindings. So you all are developers here. You probably have an existing stack in some programming language that you're already working. Um, how does it talk to your deep learning framework? Well, I hope that stack is either Python or Lua, because otherwise you're pretty out of luck. And so the solution here is actually services. Um, being able to abstract any of the work that you're doing with a deep learning framework over an API uh, will allow it to plug in to your real world services and applications so that they can actually be worked with versus having to be limited to either Python or Lua. So of those here that actually have done deep learning uh, in any way, exit code minus 99, any guess? I know you've hit it. So this means GPU out of memory, OK? And when GPU out of memory, it is not graceful. The whole thing crashes. Uh, and so we just don't have like the, you know, the, 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 the actual, uh, um, like, we haven't seen the research yet. And like, there's just, it's not mature enough of platforms so that like the memory management is there. So like you have to be very, 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 very uh, careful with null pointer exceptions and actually running out of memory because your entire process can actually just eat it as you go. So the, the, you know, the, the inverse of that is that actually the models are getting larger. So the chances of running out of memory are also a lot bigger as well. Um, so now you have these state-of-the-art networks that are, can easily be multi-gigabyte. They're producing a ridiculously large, uh, you know, they're really, really good accuracy. But they need to be loaded, they need to be scaled, and they need to not crash other people's applications. Because if you take out a GPU and you're actually in a multi-tenancy environment, you're going to get a lot of angry, angry people from your task. So the solution here is more hardware, smaller models. So let's talk about models. So in general, the larger the model, uh, the more accuracy uh, we're, we're seeing, or the inverse of that, the, le the less error. Um, the number usually behind the model is the number of layers that that neural net has. And as you can see, the larger the number, the larger the size of the, of the model. 
And so the state of the art right now, you're seeing like error rates of about 4.8%. Um, but kind of the interesting thing that's been ha happening recently is this squeeze net. And SqueezeNet is a lot of research into actually making really, really small models for neural nets that have a small size so that they can actually be put on mobile phones or, in any case, be put on GPUs without killing all the memory. But you can see that the accuracy is not the state-of-the-art accuracy. It's pretty good, but it's not the state-of-the-art accuracy. So we're kind of getting there. But again, if you want something that has a really, really high accuracy, like you're going to actually have to commit to having much larger models. So the hypothesis behind SqueezeNet, which we've been using a lot of recently, is that you know today we're just using, because they're available and off the shelf, and I just told you to 20 minutes ago that you should go grab one off the shelf, uh, we're using much larger networks than we really have to, uh, and they're more, much more complicated than they really need to be. And so this, a lot of the research behind SqueezeNet is trying to get to the AlexNet level of accuracy, which again is not the state of the art in terms of accuracy, but it has 50 times less parameters, and it's under half a megabyte on memory uh, of model size. So it's, again, not quite state of the art, but much, much closer and easier to host. There's another side of the house that's actually doing research and pruning the size of networks. So if you think about these neural nets as like this kind of like tree structure, um, you know, and you actually start pruning and cutting off. So the research really is start pruning the, the network, look at the accuracy, see if there's no like actually loss of accuracy, and if there isn't, then you got rid of some stuff that was unnecessary and you're good to go. But this, as you can see, is like really coming out of papers that were only published last year. So Han, Mao, and Dali actually did uh, you know, this, this, this really interesting paper around reduce the storage requirement for neural nets by 35x to 49x. But this is academic at this point uh, where, where that's actually going. Challenge number four, GPU sharing. So I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the talk. We have just not, like, we just haven't been sharing GPUs for 30 years like we have been sharing CPUs. Uh, it's not as well known. Um, multi context management, memory overflows, unrestricted pointer logic are just really, really dangerous in these applications because you'll take down the entire GPU um, when you're, or the entire application when, when you're doing this. And there's a limited amount of video memory. So I think right now the largest card you can get a memory per GPU is 12 gigabytes. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure, at least commercially available, uh, 12 gigabytes is as much memory you're getting into uh, you know, video memory. But if you look at how much RAM your machine has, um, you're realizing that like, you know, we've, you know, on big like, serving, like, uh, like servers, we've surpassed this by a lot. So there's just a limited amount of video memory today on these cards. Um, and then developers need a way to share GPU resources safely from potentially malicious applications that can actually go take out an entire server by just doing a null pointer exception on them. So GPU sharing is hard and fairly complex, though we have, we think, solved it like pretty well. Uh, and you know, we now the second of that is like, well, how do we do this over microservices? So now it's GPU sharing, and let's add the complexity of containers onto that. Uh, and so, from our perspective, Docker is the kind of this new standard in deploying applications, but adds an additional layer to challenge uh, GPU computing. That said, I absolutely think this is the future. Like the way to deploy machine learning and deep learning applications and productions is to Dockerize them, is to turn them into microservices, because this is like there's so many advantages to it. But it comes with like some serious problems, especially since there's not that not too many people are doing it. The first one is the NVIDIA drivers on the chip. Uh, on, on, the, on, on the outside have to match exactly the NVIDIA drivers on the inside of the containers. And so this is great if you have homogeneous hardware and you know exactly where your containers are getting deployed. But if you're actually going to potentially any machine that has you know, Docker that you can go deploy on, how do you actually match the, uh, the, the, the drivers on the inside and the outside becomes particularly cumbersome. The second one, exact same story for CUDA. The drivers on the inside of the container have to be exactly the ones on the outside. Uh, and that also becomes uh, a, a problem. So some algorithms, especially in our world, like require X windows and has to be started on the outside of the container and then mounted on the inside of the container. And that's a whole lot of fun uh, to kind of figure out how to do. And then, uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're getting to a better world here. So the first thing is like NVIDIA Docker, so NVIDIA published their Docker container, which is kind of like, they expect it to be this 
like the gold standard for using Dockerized deep learning uh, where they manage it. We have found that it still has a lot of gaps in terms of the drivers and, and really being robust, but it's definitely a, a, a really good step in the right direction. Finally, um, AWS just released their deep learning AMI, so you should be able to click on that and just deploy it directly onto uh, you know, an instance inside AWS. Um, this is a huge step in the right direction, mostly because the folks at AWS you know, beat their heads against the wall to get all the drivers working for you, and no, you don't have to, and that's a good thing. Uh, so this is, we're getting to this world where this, this is becoming more mature, uh, and it's becoming easier, and this is definitely the path forward, uh, but there's still going to be gaps uh, when doing it. So overall, lessons learned. Deep learning in the cloud, very much still in its infancy. As you can see, not too many people are doing it in production. And actually getting internet scale out of deep learning workloads uh, is really reserved for a, few, uh, for a few people. But it's getting more and more popular. Hosting deep learning models uh, is the next logical step after training the model. But the difficulty of actually deploying them and putting them behind a web service or hosting on the internet is actually completely underappreciated. And it's a different skill set. Very similar to how, you know, you, if you're thinking about you know, the training of, deep, of neural nets is much, very much a machine learning data scientist like kind of role, the actually scaling is very much a DevOps uh, operation. And those two skill sets are completely different. And so it's illogical to think that it's going to be the same folks who are going to be doing that. But we have to come up with a way of saying, hey, there's a whole now um, you know, industry that's going to be moving to hosting these deep learning models and like a skill set that's needing. The tooling frameworks are making things a lot easier, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. So the big picture here, uh, before I go into a couple of demos, is the challenges involved with creating deep learning is only half the problem. And there's a lot of challenges in actually doing the training. The second one is actually doing the deployment. That skill set uh, you know, is something that's definitely going to be needed. And actually being able to run these at scales is extremely important. So talking about running at scale again, I'm going to show a couple of demos here, hopefully the live demoing is uh, going to be on my side. Let's see here. Yeah. So two days ago, um, we launched something called Deep Style. So this is an area of research that's really, really interesting called style transfer. And it's teaching a neural net to be able to apply the, the style of one image to another. So think of it as we're actually teaching computers how to represent the style of a Van Gogh or the style of a Monet and apply it to another image. And so there's a couple fun apps like Prisma that I think that you can download on your phone and that applies that. Uh, Google announced some research around this. Facebook announced that they were doing live video around this. And the reason why this is interesting is because um, well, first of all, it's kind of creating this human aspect of being able to translate style and create these really beautiful pictures to, um, to images, but also it's like an extremely computationally intense problem. And so we launched Deep Style as kind of like a little demo to showcase how you can do it. So I'm going to go pick an image. Um, we're going to apply a style. You can see like the original image was right there. This is one of the styles that's being applied. These are full resolution images. Uh, so this is actually requiring a lot of computation behind the scenes to do. And you can see the different styles that get applied to it. Um, are, are, they make the pictures look fascinating. Um, and so we actually launched this as a demo. The API is there. We created 38 different filters that any developer can actually go build. We also open sourced an AMI on AWS that you can go train your own filters and then host that model on Algorithmia. So if you go to our blog, blog.algorithmia.com, there's all the instructions on how to do it. It's all open source and uh, that you can do. So this is all great, and, and images are fantastic. But how about video? So this is actually done live on our, like, so not live now. This is already pre-rendered. Uh, but this is actually a 4K drone video of the city of the Seattle uh, being applied on style transfer. And if you try to actually render this video on your laptop, um, it probably will take a week, maybe two, if, if your actual GPU doesn't burn down. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the reasons why services becomes really interesting here, and one of the things that I love about this is that um, the, uh, you can actually, yes, that's it. Yeah, that one on the right. Um, you can actually like, pause it, and it looks like a painting at any given time. Uh, and they look beautiful. But the thing that we did when treating this as microservices, we actually fed the video into our platform. We actually farmed out 
every single frame in parallel, not every single, but you know, we farmed out the frames in parallel, applied style transfer to the individual frames and then put them back together. And because it's a microservices platform, it allows for doing that really easily versus having to do this all like, um, you know, in, in, in parallel and in, in serially. So finally, let's see, hopefully this is the, the, the test here. I have a live serverless application here that's actually uh, taking a picture every second uh, of you. So hopefully Tommy can actually get everybody in the crowd here. Um, and actually doing the, the style, uploading it and doing the style transfer. So let's see if it's, uh, there you go. There you go. So now it's going to start taking pictures. And hopefully, come on, demo gods. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so this is actually actually so, so what's happening here is there's no back end here other than our API. So the picture is being taken by my phone, it's being sent to the API and it's being dropped in, a, in an S3 bucket and that website all it's doing is auto refresh on an S3 bucket. That's it. That's the entire thing. And we're doing style transfer completely live um, and you can build that with our API in about 20 minutes if you want to check it out. And that's all I got for you guys today. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, learning a little bit more about scaling deep learning today. Oops. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, if you guys want to try out Algorithmia, there's a code here that you can use, reInvent16 at algorithmia.com. Uh, thank you, Diego, for coming and telling us all about what you guys have been doing. It's super cool. I hope everybody gets a chance to go out there and play with that. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, please remember to fill out the survey on your uh, mobile app. Thank, thank you, you very much, much, everybody. Appreciate it.